Hello, I'm Maria Hall Brown, and this is LA Currents. Founded in 1850 as the first professional law enforcement in Los Angeles, the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, its first sheriff was George T. Burrell. Well, now the department is literally the largest sheriff's department in the country, and we are joined today by its 33rd sheriff. Delighted to have you with us, Sheriff Alex Villanueva. Nice to have you here. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Yeah, ma'am. It's very formal. <laughs> We're going to go that direction? <laughs> okay. Um, needless to say, there is an enormous amount of focus and attention on the behavior of law enforcement. I mean, it's intense and volatile, but at the same time, something that you have to handle and deal with. So what adjustments have you made recently within the LA Sheriff's Department to sort of manage all of this attention? Well, we just have all of our personnel just aware of what they're doing at all times. And it's you hate to have people working with their head on a swivel, but there's things coming from every single direction. And we just have to be mindful in terms of the impact that our activities are with the community, making sure the deputies stay safe out there, doing the right thing. And that we're constantly criticizing what we're doing, getting that feedback, making sure th the folks out on the field understand the, the impact of what they're doing. So. There has to be a very a continuous line of communication between the community and then the deputies serving the community because they're in essence they're our, my goal is that they're one and the same. Eighteen thousand employees. That's an enormous amount of humanity to manage and to make sure that um, you are aware of what's happening. Is it difficult, you know, to be able to communicate broadly across such a large and varied department? Well, in the past it was difficult, but now is, in fact, as a result of COVID-19, we found ways to communicate with everybody. Like we did a an in, uh, shift briefing, I've done it on all three shifts virtually, something that the department never ever did before, really didn't have the occasion or the need to, but with Zoom and WebEx and all these different technologies, we're gonna do a second one coming up in the next few weeks where I get to communicate a message to my personnel on all three shifts, the ones that work 24 hour jobs. Mm -hmm. And we have you know, several thousand people that have signed up for each one. So we have a very huge audience and I can take questions from them and it's a, it's a pretty nice experience. So what have you learned? I mean, that must be fascinating to you to be able to have accessibility to all of these um, different areas that maybe you would have visited once or twice a year or, you know, learned about through memos, et cetera, but now to have those one-on-ones. Have you learned anything interesting that is impacting and influencing how you manage everything? Well, last year I did 29 town halls wow. and I went all over the county, but we did it physically in person, obviously pre-COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And we met with, uh, I met with the, the leadership of the cities, the communities we were serving. And then I met with the community themselves in a, in a town hall format open and uh, took questions from the audience and very meaningful exchange. And then from there, then I talked to the deputies on the shift and told them, this is what the community is thinking about you. These are some of the concerns of the community and gave them really real time information about the impact and how they're perceived in the community. And that was very, very effective, very insightful. Mm -hmm. A lot of the community really appreciate what the deputies are doing. They had concerns sometimes that the deputies didn't really think about too much like uh, school traffic safety around school zones, things mm. like that. That's very high on the list of community members. And you'd think in some communities where they may be experiencing uh, either gang violence or something like that, or maybe cannabis shops always are up there high on the list, but number one, a lot of times is just safety for their kids. Crossing the street. Crossing the street from school, home to school and back. That's the number one priority. So we had a lot of our traffic guys took the information straight to them and say, hey, between seven and nine in the morning, we want those motors parked by these schools and the same thing in the afternoon and uh, make sure our centers, the community youth centers that we have open, our youth activity leagues, that they're available in the afternoons when kids are let out. Of course, this is before our financial uh, crisis. Right. Yeah, I guess that's really an interesting point is that we hear so much when it comes to the headlines, when it comes to dramatic crime, et cetera, but the actual concerns of a community um, may not be as dramatic as what we're hearing from the news and the headlines, et cetera. That's very true. Yeah. Well, but along those lines, there has been a lot of headlines and there mm -hmm. has been a lot of drama. 
um, and transparency is something that is a priority for everyone and I'm assuring that you're feeling that way as well. And one of the things that happened recently with an officer involved shooting um, led to the whole idea of body cams. But body cams was not something that has been in the back of your mind for a long time, it's been in the forefront, and now you have the body cams. So how are those going to be incorporated into the daily usage of the deputy sheriffs that you oversee? Well, I campaigned on it before right. I took office. That was one of my top priorities. My first week in office, we figured out how to get it faster, better, and cheaper, the standard. And uh, I thought it was a no-brainer, but it was a, uh, oh my God, the red tape we had to slog through, that it took us up until just Tuesday for the board to finally release the funds and go through the entire purchasing process. So October 1st, the first five stations are going to have them. But it's going to take us 18 months to equip the entire 5,200 personnel that we have out there in the field in uniform. So it's a, it's a process that takes a while because every deputy and security officer has to have eight hours of training on how to use the camera. We give them the policy. They sign for the equipment so they understand how it's expected to be used. And uh, then we're going to see once it, once it, they're up and running in the field come October, hopefully we don't want a tragedy to, to see what the effectiveness of it is, but it's going to be available. And the feedback we're getting from other agencies that already have them that overwhelmingly it proves what the deputies or the cops are saying all along. And uh, it's just nice to have that impartial witness to say this is from this perspective, this is what it shows. I was going to ask you, how are your deputies feeling about the fact that these body cams are going to be available to them? You mentioned obviously other law enforcement agencies, mm -hmm. but how are you, what are, what are you hearing internal? Uh, for the most part, everyone is excited and looking forward to them because we're an agency that our value is based on our trust. We have to be able to testify truthfully in court. We prepare reports based on what we see, what we observe. We have to, in front of a jury, you know, answer questions and uh, we're judged how credible we are as witnesses as and when we enforce the law and sometimes it's in very controversial circumstances but politicians they can say anything they want on TV and there's no, no repercussion in fact the more things they're likely to get reelected the wilder the things they're gonna see on TV and they've the last few days has happened against my department unfortunately same thing with activists they can say whatever they want the only people that are bound by law to say the facts just as they know them are us and the facts in reality doesn't come at the pace that the 24 7 news media cycle or the social media cycle is measured in minutes it doesn't happen at that pace and they right away oh my god it's a conspiracy you're hiding something because you're not being transparent say no we're doing our job when we have the facts then we're going to present them but we don't get to cut corners just to satisfy your curiosity. That's not transparency. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, you bring up a good point. Um, controversial decisions are definitely part of any position of responsibility, especially one laden with, the, you know, the authority. Are you surprised by the vitriol or the drama that surrounds some of the things that you say and do as sheriff of the LA Department? Uh, the sheriff's department. Well, it's kind of disappointing that people somehow can say, oh, I'm lying, I must be lying. You know, it's a favorite line. He's not telling the truth. And when I was a, a deputy, when I was a sergeant of the department, I spoke truth to power in the most oppressive environment possible, which is under the administration of Lee Bach and Paul Tanaka, who are both federal inmates, as we speak. And they really knew how to destroy careers. And I didn't care because I came across corruption, cheating. I pointed it out. I put it in writing. I said, I'm not going to participate. And this is going to lead to the downfall of the organization. I was laughed at, ridiculed, isolated, uh, pretty much sent to the gulag. And, but I realized it, it was more important to me, my credibility, my integrity, than to buy in to a corrupt system, the good old boy crowd. And the ones that did all the laughing are the ones that are now wearing pinstripes, and I'm here. So to that point, you know, being, um, as you put, you know, someone who was affected by retaliation, um, what, what do you have in place to make sure that there is uh, a lack of bullying within the department, that um, 
deputies, if they do misbehave, are held accountable for their actions and that there is no, uh, again, using the word retaliation, against someone who speaks up. Well, one thing is we expect people to speak up if they're being harassed, uh, discriminated, retaliated in any way in the organization. I expect them to speak up. We can't address something we don't know about. And as an employer, I have an obligation, once I'm made aware of it, to address it. However, people are, we're not mind readers, so we need to know what's going on. And if there's some, some culture or some hesitancy for people to step forward because they may be perceived or seen in less light by their peers, I'm saying no. I can use my own example that I spoke up at great personal expense, but I prevailed over time because I knew I had the facts and I was right. And when I took office, the Kennedy Hall fight in East LA had already happened. It happened like two months prior. The prior administration, it wasn't overwhelming their reaction to it. But the Oversight Commission, they weren't very tore up about it either. Neither was the Inspector General, neither was the Board of Supervisors because they were supporting my predecessor. And they want to bring up all the dust that comes from making all these allegations that they have no problem leveling today, now that I'm in office. But back then, they were strangely quiet about it. But I knew the problem existed when I took office, that it had to be addressed. So we initiated, we, they had start, half, hast, or half started a criminal investigation. We took it over and we did it very thorough. And Max Huntsman claims that we didn't interview enough witnesses. So therefore, uh, it's a conspiracy and the whole criminal investigation was tainted. No. If you have only four or five people involved in a fight and you have 50 witnesses, you don't need 50 statements. Once you get the participants, you get two, three, four witnesses say the same thing, you're pretty much done. Right. When we did the administrative investigation, because the DA rejected the case, then we interviewed everybody. All 70 witnesses we interviewed in detail. This thing is 3,000 pages thick. And we ended up sending letters of intent to terminate or suspend 26 employees. Mm -hmm. So anybody who claims that we don't take this thing seriously, well, they're lying or they're willfully ignorant. And pick whichever one is worse. But the point is, I take this seriously. I take the reputation of the department very seriously. I'm not going to tolerate my executives, all of our supervisors, managers are not going to tolerate, deputies themselves are not going to tolerate anybody mistreating anybody be it a fellow employee or a member of the public. Most of the mis misconduct is focused on relationships between employees. As you can see, Compton, a fight between deputies. East LA, a fight between deputies. And that's where most of it is at. Well, let's talk about these groups of deputies. And, you know, needless to say, how many, I've already mentioned how many employees, and you mentioned how many active officers there are. There is, and separate myth from reality, because this is a great opportunity for me to be able to understand, cliques within the de within the sheriff's department uh, that uh, somehow get likened to you know posses of bad behavior. Um, are they really there, and are you feeling confident that you are disbanding them, getting rid of them, and addressing the concerns that these cliques might? I think the cliques always exist everywhere, and I don't think it's unique to our department, to our profession. You go to any schoolyard, and out on the playground, there's people go to one tree, there's people go to another tree. People tend to associate with people they identify with and share a lot in common. It happens in the school environment, it happens in the military, law enforcement, medical profession, news profession. It, it is human nature to start grouping yourself together with people you share a lot of commonalities with. There's nothing wrong with that. The things that are wrong is when it deviates from just an association, a social, to behavior that threatens people or harms people. And that is a difficult line. The First Amendment gives you the right to associate. It gives you the right to put incredibly stupid tattoos on your body. There's no the First Amendment also provides for the freedom of being stupid. And uh, we can't take that away from anybody. If they want to decorate their body with any kind of nonsense, that's on them. However, it's offensive and visible, 
as an employer, yes, I can, I can take action on that. If um, a group of these people with that type of a, a tattoo or they call themselves something and they harm people, I can take action on that. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what we did. And we will continue to do that. And, uh, and it turns out the one from Compton, the uh, so-called executioner, I've been looking for who came up with a name or anything and all I can find out to date is that an attorney is the one who came up with a name in a deposition, an attorney. So even the deputies himself never heard the word. Never heard of the word. And I only heard of the word uh, a few months ago, this year. And I've been in the organization for 34 years. So it's a product, apparently, of an attorney. And he's got something to sell. It's understandable. But uh, it comes at great expense, though, because it just breeds mistrust with the community. Well, and it propagates because sometimes trying to delineate the line between myth and fact is is difficult so I'll mm -hmm. ask you a direct question um, in regards to some of these officers that have been relieved of duty because of misbehavior have you rehired any of those officers back because I had you know there's like I I couldn't determine based on my research what was fact and what was opinion in regards to have you rehired officers that you have let go I have not, I have terminated 60 employees since I took office. Yesterday I just signed three. So I went from 57 to 60. When we initially took office, we inherited a caseload of wrongful termination lawsuits. It was, I think, a 66. It's whittled down to about 30 now. We just lost one about a month and a half ago. It's going to cost us over a million dollars. Wrongful terminations are very bad, very poor fiscal management, poor leadership. And the, my predecessor prided himself on firing people. But what he forgot was you can't fire first and ask questions later. You have to do your homework. You have to have a thorough investigation. You have to honor due process. And then based on the results, if the facts are there that meets your, whatever your standard is, okay, then you, but 400 letters of intent to terminate in the span of four years is unheard of in the history of the department. And it turns out there was a rush to fire people, but not to do it the right way. Mm. So I'm, but that person exits stage left, I'm stuck holding the bag. I have to defend these. I can't defend wrongful terminations. It's unethical, immoral, and it also was a major impediment on hiring people to the organization because you, the community that is trying to get into law enforcement, they're a community and they speak. They speak amongst themselves. They have chat groups on social media and they follow everybody and they know what the standards are. Each organization is hiring. So we're competing with each other, each law enforcement agency. And we just had the worst reputation possible. So none of our employees would recommend their own family members, neighbors and friends to the organization. They say, oh, go somewhere else. I had to overcome that. So the first case that we came across was obviously the one that makes all the news, Carl Mendoin. And it turns out it was exactly what we thought. It was a wrongful termination. There was information that was exculpatory that was concealed. So garbage in, garbage out. Civil Service Commission ruled on something they didn't know what they were ruling on. Hmm. And then they had three other ones that they ruled that no, we have to bring the person back. So on orders of the commission, we brought the person back. So it ended up being a total of six. One was a statute of limitations that expired. You put so many cases into the Internal Affairs Bureau, it exceeds their capacity to investigate cases in a timely manner. You also lose cases because your statute of limitation expires. So you have to understand how the whole thing works and make sure you don't exceed the capacity of your system to investigate competently and ethically, which is what happened. So we fixed the system, made sure the investigations were ethical, make sure we honored all the time constraints that are imposed by state law. And now the 60 that I've terminated, they're gonna stay terminated, because I'm sure each one. I added my signature to the last line on the cover page. In the past, it wasn't reviewed by the sheriff. It was reviewed by subordinates. I said, no, if I'm gonna terminate somebody, I wanna see all of the evidence of this and what lead is up to it, and does it meet this, the criteria? Mm -hmm. And then I'll sign the last one. So I've added my signature to it, and I can stand behind the 60.
if someone else decides to hire him back, well, I can't account for that. Right. But that is holding people accountable the right way. Wrongful termination is just like a wrongful conviction mm -hmm. is wrong. Everyone is deserving of due process. So I don't support wrongful detentions, wrongful arrests, wrongful prosecutions, wrongful convictions, or wrongful terminations. All five of them are wrong. Mm -hmm. And we have to do things the right way. And that's how we gain credibility internally and externally. You've also determined, and you also said this early on, that you would not release undocumented um, to ICE. How does that balance your commitment to public safety when it comes to perception? You know, how do you, how do you marry those two things together that um, someone is arrested, they may be undocumented, they may be in the country illegally, and ICE wants them, but you are not going to turn them over to ICE. You know, it seems to be um, muddled in terms of people's understanding of your thoughts. Um, a very good question. And first, you need to understand that ICE and every single thing that ICE does in LA County on the radar is not even a blip. We have, I believe, somewhere around 30 to 40,000 cops in LA County between all the municipalities, say 10 and 10, us and LAPD, add up all the other police departments and then all the state agencies, federal. We do enforcement. We do state law, enforcement of state law. We release from the county jails about 120,000 inmates a year are processed through our system and released. There's roughly 300,000 bookings a year that happen. ICE does not even measure on the blip uh, on this picture of enforcement. That's how small their operation is in comparison to what we're doing. That, keep that in mind. Okay. Now, we have the largest undocumented population in the nation, roughly a million. About one out of every 10 LA County residents is undocumented. If these million residents are unwilling to report being a victim of a crime, a violent crime, they're unwilling to be report witnessing a crime, in the workplace, they're afraid to report being, their wages being stolen, uh, female, particularly female workers undocumented, you know what they endure in terms of sexual harassment and all these things because there's predators out there know that they're afraid to report for fear of uh, deportation. deportation, that number is enormous. That is public safety defending the vulnerable, the people that can't speak up or are afraid to speak up for themselves. I believe the last year that we released, I want to say it was around 12 to 1,500 inmates a year were transferred to the custody of ICE. These are people that already served their time or were found innocent in court, so there was no there's no criminal charges pending when people get released from our system and transferred to ICE, because ICE is a civil detention, it's not a criminal. And uh, so I can try to calculate the threat of those 1,200, let's, for argument's sake, 1,200, how many of them are gonna recidivate and commit a violent crime versus the million people that are not gonna report any crime, and they're subject to being victimized by anybody, U.S. citizen or not. That is a big threat to public safety. Not this itty bit little thing that the Trump administration wants to blow up as big as possible to make people afraid of the undocumented and demonize them. So this is a, in a sense, it's a cold calculated decision based on public safety, but it's a moral decision. People who've already been through our court system, they served their time or they're found innocent, we're just returning them back to where they came from. We're not involving federal immigration. We created a bright line between the two. We're not gonna get in the immigration authorities' way, but we're not gonna expend resources either helping them do their job because then we lose credibility in the communities that we serve. And I serve all of these one of the huge undocumented populations, and that is East Los Angeles Station, Pico Station, Century Station, South LA Station, up in the high desert now. And that's the population I'm worried about. Mm -hmm. 
So we don't have a lot of time left, but you did mention um, in terms of recruitment, you have approximately 630 uh, retirees. Um, needless to say, with the pandemic, the academies are on pause. Um, recruitment might somewhat be on pause. Are you worried about being able to garner the talent you need to continue with community safety? We, uh, the Board of Supervisors threw money and my predecessor to be able to recruit and to hire. It wasn't happening because the whole thing was flawed. People weren't gonna, we fixed that overnight and people came back, employees started recruiting and then uh, people recruit their own, you know, their family and friends. By word of mouth alone, we switched the entire equation overnight. We hired 1,100 deputies in one year, mm. which they could only dream of years prior. And the pipeline is there, the infrastructure, the capacity is already there, it's hitting on all cylinders. So we are hiring the best and the brightest right now. Now we're putting the brakes on it and this is gonna grind almost to a halt, but not a complete halt. Mm -hmm. But we still have very good quality candidates in the pipeline and more importantly, we have people eagerly waiting to come onto the department. They might be finishing their education. We're gonna raise our minimum education level in January 1st to an associate's degree. And I think we're going to be the first largest, large organization to do that. And we expect that we're going to continue to hire the best and the brightest to come. And we're hiring locally, not out of state anymore. We want our local kids to grow up to become deputies serving their own communities. And so we, we are going to have a supply of very good candidates from now into the future. Are you incorporating additional things into training once that happens in terms of sensitivity and de-escalation and all of those that is hot topic buttons that are... Um, all those hot topic buttons that politicians are jumping on the bag to say we are already doing those things. Implicit bias training, we have a lot of de-escalation training, we have a crisis intervention training, and a lot to do with, a, you know, with dealing with the homeless, for example, with the mentally ill. We're constantly training. What kills us, though, is when there's a budget crisis, the first thing they get sacrificed is training. Hmm. And that's the thing what we need the most, and we need to meet more of it. So we're kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul to see where we can get the training to happen and uh, let's see what happens. All right, last word, what are you most proud of uh, in your term so far? You've been on board since 2018. Um, what are you most proud of what you've been able to do? I think the permanent ban on ICE is uh, an important achievement. I got the board to uh, actually follow suit and make it permanent for future sheriffs and SB 54 allowed that gave the local board's authority to do that, so that's a good move. Mm -hmm. I think the body cameras, those are two big campaign promises that I fulfilled, and uh, hiring locally only. So we're well on our way to achieve all of the campaign promises I set out when I was campaigning for the office. And um, in spite of the political climate, which sometimes can be just, uh, sad, it saddens me sometimes, because I like to think people go into elected office to serve, advance the public's interest. But you see some very ugly, self-serving moves that really, it speaks very poorly of the reasons why they're in elective office. And I'm here, this is a temporary job, and I'm making the most of it when I have it because I want to make sure I did what I set out to do, which is to serve the community and make it safer for everyone. Do you love the job? Are you okay with the job? Are you change your mind every morning when you wake up about the job? Well, the running joke we keep saying, my wife and I, Vivian, is that I got to get my money back somehow because what's happened in the 18 months I've been in office, and I look at the last five sheriffs before me, I've lived their entire careers in office that goes back decades in 18 months with all the crisis that we've had to handle day in, day out. There's a new crisis. And social media, 24-hour news cycle, the expectations keep climbing higher and higher, and we just have to let people know that gravity still rules, there's a process that has to take place, there's no conspiracies. When we have the facts out, we're gonna deliver them to the public so they understand we're the good guys, we're doing the right thing for the right reasons. All right, well I really appreciate your candor and I really appreciate you taking this time because mm -hmm. I have no doubt that you are unbelievably busy. So it was really great to talk with you mm -hmm. and uh, well, thank you. stay safe. All right, we will do. All right. And that's a wrap on this LA Current.